Women face distinct barriers in realizing their rights and experiencing distinct kinds of violations for their rights simply because they are women. Violence aimed at women and girls, including sexual violence, harassment, and domestic violence, continues to affect one third of all women, both here in Canada and globally. That is, one in three women will be raped or beaten in their lifetime. That's about one billion women. Gender-based discrimination puts women and girls at increased risk of poverty, violence, ill health, poor education, and much more. Even in areas where significant progress has been made, such as education, these advances have yet to translate into greater equity in employment, politics, and social relations. It's important to note that rights violations and violence against women is not just a global problem, uh, but a very real issue here in Canada as well. On average, every six days, a woman is killed by her intimate partner here in Canada. Uh, thousands of women and children are currently living in emergency shelters across this country to escape domestic violence. In just one year in Canada, close to half a million women over the age of 15 reported they had been sexually assaulted. And since only 10% of all sexual assaults are reported to the police, the actual number is clearly much higher. As of 2010, there were 582 known cases of missing and murdered Aboriginal women in Canada, uh, sparking the UN and NGOs such as Amnesty International worldwide to call on our government to take issue, to take action on the issue, but without much success. Today, we hope to gain a greater understanding of these issues, raise awareness, and inspire action. We are very pleased to have our wonderful panelists here with us today. We have Marina Gamat a renowned writer and sought-after speaker on human rights, especially known for her international bestseller, The Prisoner of Tehran. Born in Iran, she was arrested at the age of 16 after the Islamic Revolution and spent more than two years in one of the most notorious political prisons where she was tortured and came very close to ex execution, having escaped only after being delivered into a forced marriage to a prison guard. She came to Canada in 1991 and has called it home ever since. So welcome, Marina. We have Jennifer Glass, Senior Director, Strategy and Partnerships at Girl Action Foundation, a national, a national charitable organization that aims to build girls and young women's skills and confidence and inspire action through innovative programs, research, and support. Jennifer joined the Girls Action Team in 2005, bringing with her many, many years of experience in progressive organizations, including the College of Midwives of British Columbia, Oxfam Canada, and groups working to create food and security food security and affordable housing. So welcome to the class. We also have Sam Sam Ahmed, is a community activist and social worker who has worked in numerous homeless shelters, battered women's shelters, refugee camps in Africa, and was the former president of Women's Place Ottawa. She is passionate about human rights and systemic racism and violence against women, and has worked towards combating racism within the feminist camp and changing hiring practices to make women's organizations more inclusive for women of color and changing and other historically excluded groups. She is currently employed in the social services department of the city of Ottawa and has recently adopted two little girls. Welcome, Sam Sam. We have Professor Subramania, an associate professor here at political si of political science here at McGill University. He studies the politics of ethnicity, nationalism, religion, gender, and race, primarily in India. Subramanian's work explores the role of identity politics in political mobilization, electoral competition, public culture, public policy, the function of democracies amidst social inequalities of long histories, and different ways in which policymakers and citizens attempt to resolve the tensions between official secularism and the significant presence of religion in public life. His latest book, Nation and Family, Cultural Pluralism, Gender and Equality and Personal Law in India, examines the changes in personal laws specific to religious groups of post-colonial India. Welcome, Professor Subramanian. So welcome to you all. Uh, the format of today will be a moderated discussion, followed by a Q&A and wine and cheese. Um, so we'd just like to say to the panelists, feel free to select whatever questions you want to answer according to your experience, work, or expertise. Uh, so, let's get started. The first question is, Anne Marie Slaughter's article, Why Women Can't Have It All, went viral a few months ago, arguing that there are still tremendous barriers to women and having both professional and personal success. From your experiences and work, what are some of these barriers and how can they be overcome? So any one of you guys can take the lead. <laughs> um, well, for me, 
in my line of work, um, I do see quite a bit about barriers um, and systemic barriers for uh, women to, um, to not be able to have success. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, sorry. Is that Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it, and this issue could, it could go from family issues um, such as affordable childcare um, so that um, uh, a woman can be able to, to work and balance a family. Um, the systemic barriers of uh, women within the organizations and uh, departments that are working within, which is still because of our gender, we are kept at a certain level and never seem to get beyond that level. When you are working in an organization where you see hundreds of women working, but all the top managerial positions and executive positions are all male, and you see that one token woman or two token women. So there's still a lot of uh, internal systemic things that have to change within uh, the, the bodies of, of places of employment, whether it's the private sector or the government sector, but also the social programs that are, uh, should be offered, to, that should be better. Everyone thinks in Canada we have it made. Uh, I have friends who, on international Facebook, say to me, Oh, you're, you know, you guys have the best social programs. Um, they, they have no clue that women in Canada are still fighting for uh, decent uh, income, uh, fair equity, um, decent childcare. Uh, and so all those things that are that would be able to make women have a balance. Of <coughs> Any other comments or questions? from the other side, but like usually what I find that a lot of times um, it is popular to look at a problem from up down, but I like to look at problems from down up. So what it would mean in my case is that, you know, I wear many hats, for example, you know, I'm a writer, uh, they call me an activist, I teach, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, and I do a lot of stuff. Basically it's five jobs in one. And always, uh, you know, I guess it is my cultural background, it's my upbringing, you know, you name. And I am from Iran, it is true, but I also have Russian. So my upbringing is a mixture of the East and the West. And yet, when it comes to my life and, you know, my jobs and all of that, I always, it, it is a barrier inside of me, I always feel responsible to make dinner. You know, I always feel responsible to go get groceries. I always feel responsible to make sure that the bills are paid. When the fridge breaks, I always feel responsible to get the repairman to come. And it is amazing. Sometimes I have to sit down. People tell me you need five assistants. And it is true, but I don't even have one. So I need to, you know, this is the way I am. This is the way I am wired. And I think a lot of us women, when I look at my friends, this is the way we are wired. So what, what we really need to do is we need to go. It's too late for me, guys. I cannot change my wiring. <laughs> Trust me, I have tried. It doesn't work. So what I need to do, what we need to do, you know, but again, I'm looking at this problem down up. What we need to do is we need to go in elementary schools. And we need to kind of forget elementary school. We need to go into kindergarten, yeah, into daycare and kindergarten, and we need to, you know, we focus so much on the ABCs and what it is. And I think we have to throw that out. You know, I mean, I wouldn't even worry about that until the third grade, okay? So, you know, trust me, up to then, we need to build responsible citizens. That's what we need to build human beings that are wired correctly. And in order to have respect for men's rights and women's rights for everybody, we need to get started in kindergarten. And we need to help people become responsible citizens. And that is, and only then can we actually turn the tide. That is only when we can have organizations, we can have governments, we can have everything, you know. Then we can get to the higher levels of society where women's rights are, are respected. I have I have a son who's four, and I would like it to start in daycare. Um, that uh, that 
we teach kids and we ourselves practice critical thinking about gender and about all kinds of other uh, points of difference and diversity because it really is learned very, very young and we reinforce it all the time in our culture, you know. Um, so it's not just a problem of the media or anything. It's, it, there's a, we live and breathe um, these ideas about men and women, girls and boys every day, all the time. Um, and yes, there, there's incredible systemic barriers still in Canada today. So 5% um, of CEOs of the top you know, 500 companies in Canada are women, 5%. Like I think it's right now like MPs and other elected representatives is about one in five is women. Um, um, and then if you look at the, the other side, two thirds of minimum wage workers are women. So there's a whole lot going on and then if we look at um, you know immigrant status and uh, ethnicity and so on, we'll see all kinds of disparities that continue to exist, right? So we know that those systemic barriers exist and yet we each have our own lives to live, so can I have it all? Yeah, I can have it all, but I'm going to define that for myself, like what is all for me. Um, and so I think that's important for everyone to recognize that we have a lot to, to be grateful for the freedoms and the choices that we have, um, and to use those to push further, but also to be happy, because it's really hard to work on these issues. Um, you know, every day, um, and it's really essential to to keep um, inner wellness in, in the face of all that. So I think everybody can have it all, except you're defining it for yourself, and it's going to be hard. But you have to find the right path for yourself. Others have already covered this uh, broad question, uh, and uh, you know, you we're told I'm a professor, and we get trained in a way where we ask narrower and narrower questions. We get into the business because we are interested in broad questions. And then we get disciplined to narrow our vision and narrow, narrow what, we, uh, what we address. Um, and this is part of a process of specialization that we are pushed into, which has its positive aspects, but uh, uh, it's something one also struggles with and against uh, in some ways. Uh, changing gender norms, that's, uh, that's what a lot of this is about. Changing norms about what women can and should do and what men can and should do. Uh, it needs to happen, it happens, and needs to happen at, in all institutions, at, our, uh, in, at, at all stages of life, different uh, areas of life. Uh, people sometimes think of some institutions as specializing in those businesses, like say the family. Family is supposed to be where you're educated. And other institutions are supposed to be more gender neutral, and uh, there you're not carrying your gender identity with you as much. But then we realize from the way we interact, for instance, in, in schools, in universities, in workplaces, that this is the case. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a battle that we, we might as well be conscious of and work on within ourselves and in our engagement. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so the second question is, misrepresentation has received critical acclaim for exposing the tremendous inequality between men and women in politics. What are some of the factors hindering women from playing a larger role in politics? And does having women in politics translate into an advancement of women's rights? <laughs> Should we start with the Mix it up. <laughs> by men with a particular culture, so it's pretty inaccessible and challenging to be in um, for, for lots of people. I think the political business is, the, you know, it's a particular business. Recently, I've been, like for Girls Action Foundation, we've been uh, networking a lot just to try and find allies, and I've been meeting some like political women power horses, and they're, they're very inspiring. Um, they often go into it after their kids have been raised if they have kids, you know. Um, so that's a definitely a factor. I think that is extremely demanding. And so um, if you have children, it is, how do you balance that? Um, so that's a factor. Um, and the culture, I think, of politics is a big factor. I think 
that sexism is a big factor. You would probably experience a lot more explicit sexism every day if you were a politician. Remember the comments about like Belinda Stronic way back when? You know, you can't like it's 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 a tough tough area. Um, but I hope that. There's, there's a great organization, um, for example, in Quebec called Groupe Femme Politique et Democratie that is working to, you know, they're, they're starting at the like college and university level, trying to support um, young women to go into college and university politics and then support them to go into municipal later and on and on. So I think it's, it's really exciting. There's lots and lots of opportunity and movement. Um, and obviously, just because someone is a woman doesn't mean she's going to have particular views. But I do feel that because women experience certain things as girls, as they're growing up, their eyes are more open to some of the really tough stuff than young men are because they're not exposed to it. So hopefully just that experiential knowledge would um, make them uh, able to make better choices in their, in their uh, decision making. For me, I think of you're gonna find that I'm, I'm radical in a lot of stuff. So you start from, do I you go from the bottom? I don't know. I start with a whip. <laughs> now, um, if I speak to, I came to Canada 21 years ago. And when I first came here, I came here thinking, oh wow, you know, I'm coming to a free land because my sisters are there, and sisterhood, feminism, um, you know, they're so far ahead of every other place I've ever been to. A few years ago, a couple of years later, I had the rude awakening that, you know, no, it's, not all that gold, you know. Um, for women of color, because I can speak to being a woman of color, a new Canadian, a single parent, I've been a single parent for uh, 16 years. Um, I found that, and I did get involved in politics because I was working in women's organizations and we were doing a lot of lobbying within the government for women's programs, and I eventually became, um, started off as a volunteer and eventually became a president of a women's organization. And I found that for us, we were okay as long as we were tokens. So we were okay if the MPs would have us over to their office and say, this is Sansa Mohammed Ahmed, she's from this community. So all of a sudden, I had a label on me, which is not something I wanted. I just wanted to be sad. You know, I vote for you, I, I'm fighting for the rights of my neighbor, the men, the women, the elderly. Uh, but as a woman of color, immigrant, new Canadian, I found myself serving a lot of uh, uh, purposes for them. So they could write in their papers, so they could introduce me at their gatherings, or they could have me invite a few of my friends so that the color room would get a little bit more colorful. So um, here we are, we're that far. Women, in my opinion, a lot of women of color, even though there are those of you that are highly educated women that, that will make it to certain levels, majority of us are, are out the door over here. The mainstream women who are born in this country, who are Caucasian, who have the privilege I still knocking on the door of the of the old boys club, the politics. And that level, you know, it was just out of my radar, let's put it that way. And you know, again the fights that I have fought all my life, it was, you know, just one example to give you is for the testimony of a woman according to the law in Iran, not to be worth half of a man. You know. <laughs> So this has been, and this is the ground zero of the battle. The battlefield that I'm in is for a nine-year-old girl not to be married off in a temporary marriage, okay? So the marriage has an expiry date on it and a price tag. To be married off a nine-year-old girl to a seven-year-old man for half an hour so that her family can get somebody. That is where my battle is. So, you know, I remember the very first time, it was a couple of years after my book came out, and I was uh, at an event, and this uh, woman, a uh, very white woman, came up to me and said, have you ever considered entering politics? And I was like, as if I had been struck by lightning. I kind of looked around me and I said, who, me? And she said, yes. And you know what, that was the very first time in my life that I actually faced that question. And to be honest with you, to be really honest with you, I thought, no, 
I do not want, I realize, I, you know, now that I have a choice, you know, now that this country, Canada, allows me, well, there are obstacles and all of that, allows me to become a politician. Well, I may have raised my kids. I don't want to. And again, that, that led to another, well, why don't I want, want to become a politician? That's because I, I, I'm very sorry to say that what I have learned in Canada is that politicians are usually at the mercy of their party's politics. And that is not who I am. I'm a rebel. I'm a rebel by nature. If I want to become a politician, I'm going to be fired or go to jail within, within five days. So honestly, you know, I think there is a bigger question to ask here. Why on earth would a woman, like, would she be insane to want to become a professional, professional liar, you know? And that is actually, you know, how I, I would even, you know, even if they offered me to become one, with a good salary, I mean everything, I would say no. Because you know what, sorry, but that's not me. Given who they want to go politics, they have done so in different societies at various points, uh, and it has made a real difference. Um, but of course, there is much there is scope for uh, increasing women's political roles considerably. Um, I mean, women play roles from outside the system, pushing for entry, as they did when they pushed to get voting rights, become uh, uh, gain political equality, uh, or at least the minimal political right that their right to vote involves, um, and then made their way to the political politics. I mean, I come from a country where, uh, for about nearly 20 years, a woman was the most powerful politician in the country. Uh, and even today, uh, probably for the last 20 years, another woman who was the first woman's daughter in law uh, has been probably the most powerful politician in the country. That leads to a significant empowerment of women out there in society? Uh, in general, no. Because this has something to do with the outlook of these particular women leaders and the political party to which they belong. The first woman, Indira Gandhi, became the uh, Prime Minister Party because, and initially the leader of the uh, Don and Congress Party and the Prime Minister Party because her father had been Mr. And now her daughter-in-law has, has the power she, she does because of her familiar thing. And the political party itself wasn't built around the empowerment of women, wasn't a central issue around which the party is built. So there are certain ways in which particular women may play, not just token women, but be uh, perhaps the most powerful figure in a party or a government and still have not all that much of an impact on the lives of women. So it makes the numbers make a difference. Uh, so not just having one woman, but many women. But sometimes even many women. In some, some countries there are quotas uh, in women's in, in representation where women are given a certain share. Now this kind of descriptive representation, as some people call, call it, that is the representation of women by women works to some extent. That is women who are elected are more likely to be sensitive to the concerns of women, just as uh, other people belonging, especially to historically disadvantaged groups, may be more sensitive to the interests of their group. Uh, it's more likely there are more numbers. But even these quotas, when you get your numbers, it doesn't necessarily get you autonomous actors. It doesn't necessarily get you people who give women's rights most important, and have the independence and power to be able to assert push for them. Sometimes there are pawns of the major leaders of the parties who nominated them, maybe because they are related to some male leader, uh, and the male leader pulls the strings from behind the, the seats. So a lot depends also on patterns of mobilization. Uh, how, how strong are women's organizations? And not only women's organizations, how how much are various rights of various women taken 
not taken into account by organizations on the press for the rights of oh, speaking as somebody who was uh, on the university faculty, a university employee, a, uh, a farm worker, uh, uh, somebody with people working in a factory, etc. Um, even where organizations are supposed to be pushing not for women's rights, but for the rights of uh, academics, the rights of uh, uh, workers in a particular factory, uh, the rights of farm workers, or whatever else. But how far do they take changing the roles of women within those organizations as an important value issue? That makes a difference. So not just quotas, but grassroots empowerment will turn so numerical presence of women in the part of the institutions into more real more real power to be able to change policy and change women's lives. It also means the women who are out there not represented in powerful institutions can keep exerting pressure on those who are inside so that they at least pay attention to some of their things. Okay, so next we're on to religious freedom versus women's rights. Uh, the question we have is Many gender-specific human rights violations are grounded in cultural and religious practices. Women's rights activists in a number of national settings have stressed the need to transform religious law and practice, not only as a means of ending gender-based restrictions on specific human rights, but also as an essential step towards dismantling systemic gender inequality. However, the most comprehensive challenges mounted by states to international norms, guaranteeing women's rights and their application have been couched on defenses of religious liberty. So this has represented a sort of gridlock of human rights. How do we reconcile efforts to protect women's rights and religious freedom? Um, I think there, they, those two should not even be attached together. As a Canadian woman living, if we talk on an international level, um, global level, where we're dealing with uh, different uh, traditions and different uh, uh, bodies that uh, control those different specific places that we have no political power over, but yet we can have, uh, we can advocate for, fight for, and keep pushing for changes to happen in those places. However, we think Canada, I'm speaking as a Canadian, no religious teachings of any kind should impose or deny me my rights as a woman, my human rights as a person, period. And that's where that discussion needs to stop. So no one should be entertained, no government should entertain religious teachings of any kind coming into war, or excuses being made, oh, she was killed because she was Muslim, because there was some unattended, or the dismissal of, as soon as violence takes place, that whole dismissal of, oh, it happened because they're of that gender, or it happened because they're of that religion, or it happened because that's their tradition, that's their culture, no. My basic human right as a woman should well be protected 100% by my Canadian law, regardless of what religion I may come from or those who are trying to bring in religious teachings of any kind into our world. That should be, that's where I stand. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that long. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, especially to me, it is a little bit mind-boggling when people start to even entertain some of these possibilities. Um, Let's say, just let's go back to the, to the, you know, we, you know, sometimes when you talk in very general terms, it's difficult to imagine things. So let's be very specific, okay? I'm going to give you an, you know, again, I come from a majority Muslim country. And here in Canada, and in the West in general, but especially in Canada, and in the United States, I travel all over the, the world. I was just in the United States last week. Before that, I was in Geneva. No, no, before that, I was in London, England. Before that, I was in Geneva. So I'm very familiar with the situation in the West. So as soon as you say Islam or Islamism, the color of the half of the people in the room turns chocolate. It's like a bomb just went off and let's run for dear life. I mean, people, we are having a civilized discussion. We are educated human beings. I am a Catholic, okay? But I'm just waiting to be fired from the Catholic Church any minute now. 
because the amount that I criticized the Catholic Church, I, I didn't even the new pope, even though he looks like a really nice guy, he's probably going to get fed up with me really quick. So, as a Catholic, I'm not afraid to stand in the face of the pope and say, excuse me, what do you mean women cannot become a priest? That's ridiculous. Don't be funny. You know, so the same thing with Muslims. You know, I know a lot about Islam. Actually, to be honest with you, I know the Holy Book of Muslims, the Quran, better than I know the Bible. So when I talk about Islam, I speak as an educated person. And it is a fact, this is not my personal opinion, that in the country of my birth, Iran, that whose laws are based on Sharia law, which is the Islamic religious law. Go Google it. Go look it up. This is not my opinion. Okay, the Islamic Sharia law that is used in Iran. Of course, Sharia law has many versions, and in Iran they have one version of it, but uh, the Iranian law, the constitution, the criminal the law, everything, has been translated in English, so go look it up. So, in Iran, again, very specific, the testimony of a woman is worth half of a man. Okay, according to Iranian law. So, here in Canada, is that so? Is the testimony of a woman worth half of a man? No, and for good reason, because we have evolved, because we have come forward, because we are trying to make men and women equal, and not that we have 100% succeeded, but we have succeeded to a certain degree, right? Okay, so now, there are people out there who believe that we should go to Sharia law in Canada. That in Canada, the testimony of a woman should be allowed to be worth half of a man. And you know what, guys? I have a problem with that. So, religious freedom, I'm totally for it. But when, for me, religion, my religion stays at home. Whatever religious beliefs I have, I'm not going to make you believe in them, and I'm not going to set a set of laws and rules and make you, who are not a Catholic, who are not even a Christian, who might be an atheist or whatever, abide by my laws. So my religious liberties, they end where yours begin. So we have to be very aware of this reality. I live in Canada. I escaped with my life from Iran. I came, came close to death because of the laws that govern Iran many, many times. And I came to Canada because Canada, with the secular laws, with the civilized laws, it offered me a safe haven. Canada saved my life. Canada saved my family. So, if the same laws that I escaped from they want to be implemented one day in Canada. Where am I going to go to the South Pole? You know, it is kind of scary. If I want to have the same laws to govern my life and the life of my family, I would just pack my bags and go back to Iran. Guess what? Iran does take immigrants. So, you know, when we live in the free world, we have choices. But those choices are naturally limited by the law. And we have to respect that. And religion has to expect that, individuals have to expect that, organizations have to expect that, no matter what. Can I say something real quick? I just wanted to add, working within the uh, shelters for women who are fleeing abuse and uh, dealing with the court system for um, 15 years, um, even though Sharia law is being talked about and we're finding that it's not there in our court system. Unfortunately, I have seen it and I've um, witnessed it and I've seen many other workers out in the field witness it where judges and lawyers are using cultural and religious practices and traditions to make their decisions on cases where a woman has been physically battered, where her children have been taken away, where she has been kept in confinement, where she has... I have met women who were battered in their home and kept for years and not allowed to go outside within Ottawa, within Canada. And some judge sitting there considering having a discussion and a consultation with, with lawyers and cultural interpreters about this woman's cultural and, and traditional background. And that is very disturbing. So 
we may not have some of these uh, religious practices that uh, decisions being made within within our court system, but be aware from the local community agents to the first person that woman may go for a vote, to when she ends up in court, to the judge who's gonna make her decision. Some of these things are influencing how some of our justice is carried out, and that is a scary thing. Um, and then on the other hand, when we hear about, like, girls, I work with Girls Action Foundation, so we're working on violence against girls issue, you know, to prevent violence against girls and to raise awareness also of, the, of what is actually happening in Canada, which often we don't notice because it's normalized. Um, and yet, in the news, when we hear about violence against girls, it's usually with, because it's an honor killing. And of course, the, this, is, this is not acceptable, it's a horrible crime. And, but what happens is that because that's usually the only context in which we hear about uh, violence is that it becomes racist and it's like, oh, it's, they're the ones who are doing the violence. And it's, um, it's totally untrue, uh, unfactual. So young women 15 to 24 are the most likely to experience spousal abuse in this country and it's all across the board. And it doesn't matter what social class, race, or educational background, it makes no difference. So I, I just, before I came over, read the, the newest uh, stats can report on violence against women in Canada. That's what it said. Like They just looked at the numbers and they said no influence of culture and all of those other factors. So that's, you know, if we think of like, you know, journalism and uh, representation, it's like, yeah, that's, uh, is it a, it's, it's just, it's cyberbullying. It's not that common compared to sexual harassment, which happens to girls all the time in high schools. And yet, that's the sexy term. It's, it's the same with honor killing. So I just, I just really encourage everyone to, especially in covering issues, to not just go with what's sexy, because it's not the reality and even and but and yet it's very difficult because we face both. We have to we have to grapple with both realities, which is that no it, culture and religion cannot be an excuse. Mm -hmm. And violence. also, yeah, and what does it do to the others? When you've got one so-called honor killing because all the newspapers and TV yeah. have taken that and exploded it all over Canada, you may have had within that one hour two hundred Canadian women assaulted, raped, beat, even killed. Yeah. But. You have to look at the routine. I drafted about 20 years ago, posed post with this kind of question, and I have said I was raised an atheist, uh, raised to believe that religion holds people back uh, uh, and holds women back too, uh, and so tended to frame most questions of social rights and you know, public concern in terms of personal life and values. But uh, I saw, uh, I mean, and to that extent, maybe I got sort of rewired, uh, partially rewired, uh, because I returned to my agnostic, atheist, secularist ways of uh, engaging with questions uh, all the time. Uh, but I got rewired because uh, I saw that for a lot of people, uh, culture is important for all people. Nobody has no culture. Nobody is a, is, is, is a blank cultural machine. If everybody has their own individual culture, which is which partly draws from what gets typecast as these cultures of large groups, but it's usually each individual uh, puts together their own personal culture, including their religious slash spiritual culture. And as far as religious practice in particular, in particular concern, I saw that a lot of people were religious in some sense. Uh, religion in some sense shaped their understandings of who they were, what society is about, what the purpose of the world is. So it shaped them what they wanted to do, not just at home, not just in, private, in the private sphere, but out there in the world. And in many cases it led people, religious visions motivated people to go out in the public, fight against dictators, assert the rights of various underprivileged groups, and uh, fight for democratization in various senses. I also saw 
that especially religious minorities in many countries face uh, various uh, challenges, their uh, forms of outright oppression or other forms of discrimination. And to that extent, as one who's lived in North America for uh, I don't know, 33 or 34 years, I'm not sure I've lived in any, something called the free world, but there are different societies in Asia and North America where I have experienced and made for myself uh, certain kinds of freedom at uh, uh, the institutional context makes some difference. But I see that for a lot of people, religion makes a difference to their public expectation of what they want to do in the world. And for other people, uh, dominant understandings of religion, what people say the religious culture of the society is, or just the national culture of the society is, it is it's, it's fun. That makes a difference to what they are able to pull off, even if they don't think in terms of religious culture, even if they don't think in terms of national culture, what they can accomplish if they can frame what they want to do in terms of, well, this is the right Hindu thing to do, this is the right Christian thing to do, this is the right Islamic thing to do. But they actually have a better shot at, actually, at accomplishing what it is they, they want to do. So in a context like that, I'm not sure that we can fight the battle for human rights, or fight battles for human rights, for women's rights, for anybody's rights, while saying, okay, let's just get religious rights out of it. Let's just, get, let's just get cultural rights out of it. There are various culturally specific and religiously specific ways in which life is lived and rights are conceived. And we have to engage in that. More concrete, um, in Canada, the issue of Islamic law became a matter of public debate in connection with the demand that some students for uh, Islamic tribunals to be recognized. They were already functioning. And in Ontario, all, as, as many of you may know, and many of you may know this better than I do, already certain other groups, Mennonites, Jews, uh, some small, smaller Muslim sects, Ismailis, they already had their own tribunals, which had a certain level of official recognition. And another set of Muslim groups setting up their own tribunals said, give us recognition. Uh, let the, the official legal system engage with the system. They didn't claim to trump the legal system. They didn't claim that they would have an authority. Some people did. Some people said these tribunals have to uh, substitute for the official legal system. Others said that they would supplement the official legal system. But the issue got framed in terms of if you stand for Sharia law, any demand that something called Islam get recognized means you're recognizing Sharia law which means you are opening the door to what happens to women in Afghanistan, in the Taliban, in Iran, under the Ayatollahs, and in various other places. And therefore, the defense of secularism, the free world, means you have to shut the door to this. What's the concrete consequence? In many cases, some of these tribunals continue to exist underground, and there's less official oversight. There is uh, uh, the recommendations made by official commissions that uh, government regulations such as charter rights be applied to the ways in which uh, these uh, tribunals operate, but those restrictions, are, those constraints aren't placed on them. And they are freer, in a sense, underground, freer to do, to rule as they wish. And of course, uh, women and men who disagree with those uh, decisions may go to the official courts, may go to the police and kill them. But often there are enough people who don't have the power, who don't have the power to pull a dog and have to live with this. Uh, in India, I've got marginally involved in efforts to increase the inheritance rights of the people. Uh, I got involved in it because I was just doing research on it. Then I was doing research on it because I think it mattered. Uh, Twenty years ago, I would have said what we needed was to sweep aside uh, the, the elaborate system of religious laws that govern family life in India and establish a secular system which I would have imagined would give them give really more rights. But there are, India has criminal laws that are supposedly secular. 
part say when it comes to raid, it exempts army officials in areas of conflict from coming under the uh, uh, authority of the legal system. Um, uh, uh, they can be dealt with not by the general criminal legal system, but by army courts. So this opens the door. More than half of uh, officially reported rapes in India are uh, committed by people in the army or the police. And it gives many of them the, uh, 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 you know, the space to, uh, to engage in gang rapes and get away. And Sonia Gandhi, the most powerful woman in India, made no effort uh, to implement the uh, recommendation for the mission that the army also be Army officials also be brought under the jurisdiction of criminal law when it comes to rape, including gang rape. But I saw that if you said, sweep aside the, the personal laws, many people have been saying that. People in the, women, the majority of women's organizations have been saying that in India in the 1970s. And they found they weren't getting anywhere. They found that it just wasn't working for them. People would then mobilize in the name of religious rights and block these efforts. So it actually works better if you mobilize it in terms of a, here are these Hindu norms that justify giving women access, equal access to ancestry. And when the battle was fought in those terms, by 2005 we were able to win the battle. Uh, partially win it, not, not fully. But if we had fought the battle as all women ought to have the rights to equal access to the property of their families, we'd still be fighting. Would be an existing paper. Right now, Muslim women don't have the right to get their share of agricultural land most of the year. If it is fought as exempt, the question of inheritance from Islamic law, we'll still be fighting a generation from now, maybe dead in the, uh, the battle in the But by framing the issue as applying Islamic law, applying particular understanding of Islamic law to inheritance, well, women don't get equal rights to agriculture land. The, only, the daughter gets only half the share of, uh, of, of uh, sons. But this means they may actually get the share within the next five years. And so I'm involved in, uh, in that initiative because I think it may actually work. And it may actually give uh, uh, about half a million Muslim women in India uh, access to land, which will make a huge difference to their uh, <coughs> So these are reasons why I like the way you frame the question, not do we need to look at a push for women's rights or respect women's freedom, or constrain the space for women's freedom, but how do we need to reconcile our efforts to push for both of these values with both of these things? Sorry, I... Uh, so would you suggest that we even think about it in Canada? Because think India and things. Canada are to think about even opening the doors to those tribunals or to those. Well, that would you personally, I just want to know your opinion. I would, for Canada. I wouldn't change the existing system of uniform secular official family right. for a variety of ethnic, religious, or other family laws. However, I would recognize that there are uh, various uh, informal arbitration uh, councils operating in society. As well as those are not ones that affect the quality and safety of women and children. Try, try and. And how do you separate? Try and impose those, uh, yeah. those restrictions on them yeah. uh, by officially recognizing them, make them subject to charter rights, so that uh, you can say what they do. And there, the extent of the demand is coming from relatively weak uh, minority groups. Mm -hmm. It's that which easier compared to what it's like in countries like uh, uh, like India, Indonesia, in which there's been a long history of official recognition of women's law, and a much, and uh, the forces of religious politics are far stronger than the right now. For me, I would like to see the opposite. I would like to see our current laws strengthened to include women and children from certain cultures and certain religions because will not be uh, the consequences of abuse and beating, battling, killing will even be stronger because to, to stop the imposing of one's other whatever it may be. I'm a Muslim. I come from a tradition, the so-called most dangerous city in the world. 
No condition. Okay. And I don't want, I do not want the loss of my Muslim brothers, I don't want Al Shabaab, I don't want Al Qaeda, I don't want any Islamic or any Christian or any. I, when I go to a court for the justice of a woman or a child, I would like it to be completely free of tradition, culture, anything. Because the majority of those so called tribunals are run first of all by men, second of all by men who come from societies, yes, who oppress women, but also even from more societies that oppress women worse. Well, women don't have any rights or any say or any, um, uh, they do not participate in even the uh, making of, uh, of, of, of those tribunals or the decisions or how things are governed. So the sheer existence of those tribunals to me is problematic. But if you don't recognize it, then they go under the distance. Yeah, You know, I, I'm sorry, I, I need to, I need to ask. No, 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 I know. You know what? I think you can see something interesting here. Now, I'm trying to observe. You know, here on this side, you can't help but notice. You know, you have these two women. You know, you can tell that we have bled. Okay? We have literally bled. We have been directly in a situation where we were nobody. We were nothing. Uh, now, we are talking about Canada. You know, and I guess, you know, you, we, you have to become clear what your framework is. Are we talking about India? Are we talking about Canada? Because let's face it, the situation varies a good deal. You know, where our laws are, where our society is here in Canada, and where it is in India, these are two very different issues. And the same thing in Iran. But uh, what, you know, I have been able to observe, because most of my friends are Muslim. And uh, I'm going to give you one, one very small example. Um, a friend of mine in Iran, she has a PhD in genetics. Okay, so women in Iran, you get educated. She, she has a PhD in genetics. And her husband had a psychological disorder and was beating her every day of the call to the point that she was afraid that she was going to die. So she goes to one of these religious tribunals, which in Iran are the only thing available. Guess what? In Iran, there is no secular law that would protect her, so the woman has nowhere to go but that religious tribunal. So she goes to the Sharia judge and she says, you know, my husband is beating me and I want a divorce because according to Islamic law, divorce is allowed. And the judge listens to the case, basically the whole court takes five minutes, and says to her, well, you must be doing something wrong if your husband has to beat you. Go home and be a good wife, and he wouldn't have to beat you up. So now, you know, think about Canada. You know, I have many friends who come from very religious or, you know, extremely extremist cultural backgrounds. They come here in Canada. Many of these women, they do not even speak English. You know, right now I have this case that the woman doesn't even speak English, and she's completely limited. Basically, she's not here in Canada. She is not allowed to leave her home without her husband, without male accompaniment, basically. Okay, but what does, what, what we do have in Canada is that there are laws. This woman, if she's empowered, you know, through education, you know, maybe, maybe it will take a generation or two even, but at least her daughters, you know, even if we completely use hope for her, if her, you know, her daughters, they speak English. So we can educate at least the second generation because they would have the language, they would have the skills, they would have the knowledge not to be slaves, you know, literally slaves of these religious tribunals to educate. It is only through education. And here, you know, again, India is a different story, but here in Canada, we have the possibility of educating these young people. And, and I have seen it happen with my own eyes so that they wouldn't be enslaved by these religious tribunals. Now, uh, to recognize them, sometimes to recognize them, again, you know, they're experts and they would need to be into it, but we have to be aware that there is a danger that sometimes to recognize something could potentially mean to empower it as well and to actually help, help it get established even in a, on a bigger and a wider scale. So we need to be aware of these dangers. We need to discuss them. We need to look at them carefully. 
And unfortunately, here in the West, we have a culture of immediate gratification. So we expect you know, our efforts to bear fruit tomorrow. No, we are not going to. This might take one, two, three, four generations. But if it's going to take four generations, I'd rather start today and not wait until tomorrow. So these are delicate issues. And when we are talking about women's rights, we need to look at these women and at their very real problems and the fact that their lives could be Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd like to shift the conversation a bit to the role of the media and its significant impact in shaping women's issues. Uh, we are quite tight on time, so I'm going to ask some questions of it. Uh, news media has been instrumental in bringing global attention to multiple ins instances of violence in the past few months, the gang rape in India, the Steubenville case in Ohio, um, and obviously violence against women is nothing new, but the media seems to be paying attention more selectively now. So my question is, do you think there has been a shift towards greater media coverage of these issues? Um, what do you think prompted this shift? And do you believe the media has been responsibly reporting on issues of violence against women? When you just mentioned two cases, in the case of where the young men uh, brutally uh, raped that girl, I've been observing actually for the last two days how the media has been covering it. And 90% of what they're speaking about speaks of the boys, the loss of the boys' futures. They had such a bright future ahead of them. They were such good football players. They had never done anything wrong before. They were good boys. That's all I've been hearing. Here's a girl, brutally raped over and over again. But, um, new pictures of her put out in the media. Horrible things done to this girl for the rest of her life. And we have to sit there and on print and on the internet and on the TV, and this included uh, CNN, major news channels too, give praise to these rapists. Uh, the, uh, in some cases, like the case in India, yes, it got global attention <coughs> and it got global movement, but also what did it get the media? We always have to think of what stories do they pick to what benefit for themselves when it comes to getting the audience, when it comes to making that money. Also, some stories are picked up for purposes of political purposes, to make a specific place look a specific way. When we look at Canada, we have hundreds, hundreds of Aboriginal women who have been murdered, who are missing, who are raped and beat and killed every day in this country. Tell me. When is the last time you open your television, or your radio, or, or your internet, and you see that as a screaming, urgent matter? Because it should be. Because that is hundreds of our women, of our Canadian sisters, who are dead, missing, gone. The one occasional one you will hear a story about her, the first thing that comes, that they discuss, is this woman was a prostitute, she was uh, in drugs, they will pick a story of a woman who died in downtown Ottawa, who was a prostitute. They will pick a woman who was a prostitute in wherever Vancouver. And first of all, why does it matter that she's a prostitute? She was a woman. She is a woman and she got killed. And a brutal crime happened here. And this is a brutal crime that continues to happen in your society over and over and over again against one gender. So you really have to, you guys are young. Open your minds to what the media is about, what their motives are, what their benefits are, how smooth they are, how imbalanced they are. Study that hard and don't believe easy because the media does not do women and girls justice when it comes to violence and coverage. I also um, wanted to, to uh, actually I wanted to read a quote of in regards to indigenous women and girls who are being um, who experience violence at much higher levels uh, in Canada than, than any other group. Um, so I think it's really it's a really important issue, and I also think that the way it's covered um, leaves so much of the story out. And so this this um, quote I just came across, and it's from a, a Métis girl. Um, so just listen to her analysis because it's uh, it's very deep. Um, I feel like I don't really matter. Like if I got hit bad or went missing, like who would really know? Like the kids who got shuffled off to residential schools, 
if something happened to them, who really knew? So, especially in Canada, the context for Indigenous women and girls and violence is related to our colonial history, and and so and it's and it's so so often when a specific uh, case is covered, it's about the juicy details, you know, and it's like it's. There's there's a whole backstory and a whole context um, that needs to be explored and um, yeah and it's and it's about justice right it's not about how short her skirt was. Mm -hmm. um, so I I really wish I could have brought this up more especially in the in the context of social media. Um, the panelists mentioned earlier that the people are very instrumental to, to changing society and social media is an increasingly important part of growing up for most people today. So my question is, how can everyday users of Facebook, Twitter, people who are using media daily, um, how can we use these as tools for positive change? Well, there are a lot of causes, and I'm sure you've seen that. Now, when I first got Facebook, of course, you know, my daughter's well, it was funny that at my age I got one Facebook, but I soon got addicted to it, and they couldn't understand why I was so addicted to it. Because every chance I got, I was on Facebook, and I, I went and got an iPhone, I got an iPad. And I, what they don't realize is that I am actually in contact with hundreds of different organizations from Asia to Europe to Africa. I am now attached to so many different organizations and human rights groups and people who are doing on an individual basis, making a difference in their city or in their village, people from Geneva to people from Kenya to South Africa to India. I, I had the privilege of growing up in different parts of the world because I went to boarding schools. I grew up in India for four years. I was in Europe. I grew up in North America, different parts of Africa. And I uh, always thought that having that global dialogue, that what makes you and I the same, what makes me as a woman down in Botswana the same, or in Somalia the same, the communalities we have now when we come together. So social media is actually, it's becoming a big tool. And utilize it for all the human rights activism. Uh, you know, learn about your world. Learn about who does what and what can you do. And it does make a difference. I mean, that's my only advice. I'm doing it, and I'm almost 50. So you guys. <laughs> And, and I'm only 37, but I, I got involved in activism when I was a teenager. And just like back then, to get your message out, you had to go through traditional media. And, um, and so today, I don't pay much attention to traditional media. And I think a lot of folks in the milieu are trying to make a difference. I mean, a lot of people now get their news and their analysis through, um, through social media. And it can be much more nuanced that way. It can be deeper analysis, other sides of the story, like other voices. Um, and I think that's extreme, I think it's extremely positive and I think it's a major, major force in progressive movements in Canada and probably around the world. And just one thing, I'm sorry. I'm cutting you off, I don't mean to. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, they say women, you know, ladies go first, so you know, I'm going to use that. <laughs> So yeah, my, my children are actually completely avoiding me on Facebook because you know that, that can be really an embarrassing situation. But I totally agree. Facebook is a tool and it connects you to the world instantaneously. And I'm right now I'm in touch. You know, if you look at my Facebook page, there are a lot of names that you know you would recognize they are Iranian. And a lot of these Iranian names they actually live in Iran. And that is the beauty of it. Iran is actually technologically very advanced and young Iranians are extremely educated and they keep on creating proxies because the government keeps on blocking, right, and they come up with new stuff. So all the time, you know, they can circumvent all of these blocks, you know, it takes them longer, of course, it limits them to a certain degree, but social media can be used to do a lot of evil 
as we know. And social media can be used to a lot of good. Just something, you know, I, I'd like you to, to kind of give it a little bit of thought is that don't forget that information doesn't necessarily translate into wisdom. Okay, so you can have a world of people. You could be the walking, talking Google, right? But does that make you wise? Not necessarily. So what the social media can do for you is that it can deliver you that information. It can deliver you that, uh, you know, the personal side of the story, which to me is missing from the news. So it can make it personal. It can make it, clo you know, really close to home. But, so, you know, critical thinking is the filter that you need. So once you go on Facebook, you have to always think about the information that you have received critically. And I think that's the difference, really, that changes information into wisdom. It is critical thinking, right? I just want to share a really quick story just to give you guys an example. There was a woman that was raped and arrested in my country, in Somalia, to pay more petition. This woman, a young man went to interview her about the rape. She was gang raped by a bunch of soldiers who were in their uniforms. And that's how she could identify that they were soldiers for the government. She was arrested, so was the young man who interviewed her. She was sentenced to jail, and so was he. He was sentenced to jail for a year or so because he entered a house where there were a man was in present. Some bullshit, excuse my language, law. Um, and she was put in prison because she made up stories about the government soldiers. This story came out, hardly anybody had heard about it, but a bunch of us on Facebook picked it up. And I belong, like I said, I belong to many, many uh, different organizations, not just women's organizations, but we mobilized. And across the world, we had thousands of people and university age students and groups, everyone getting this story out into the media, into the governments, into everywhere. And a campaign just took on by itself. Within a matter of a week to two weeks, there was a, a social media campaign. Glad to say the woman is free, the guy is free, but just an example. Say that they man shouldn't uh, enter a room where uh, yeah, somebody right. else is present. And I, I thought of something perhaps superficial, but maybe, maybe it's not obvious in that room, because I have a colleague who's trying to force himself on various women's students at this. And of course, they, they haven't fired him because some of the people responsible for dating action perhaps have done that in the US and want to, uh, you know, in return for letting him off, want to let off themselves. But at least they have said he can't, he can't sit in a room uh, with a woman student with, uh, and nobody else present. So well, well, the mostly there is extended family in our communities. There's never, in our communities, there's always grandfather, uncle, cousin, the neighbors, half the cousins. There's never one person sitting in a house in, in my country. Right? This is a Western concept. But, um, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's just a made, it's, it's a made up law that, you know, he talked to her alone because a man was in prison. Meaning a man, a man who controls her, meaning her husband. Yeah, that was just, this wasn't a serious response to what he said. I know. But I thought I would use this excuse to also I mention know. something that's happening right here. Um, uh, but I mean, I, I'm over 50 and uh, I'm a uh, <laughs> uh, fairly uh, uh, passive Facebook user in, you know, for the most part. But even I got, uh, got pulled into uh, putting it to some, uh, some useful effect because well, there's a a uh, woman in a kind of uh, underprivileged region of India who's supposed to belong to a tribal group, a school teacher, uh, who's being imprisoned because she wouldn't give in to the pressure of the police to um, act as an informer about the uh, Maoist, Maoist insurgents operating in the area. She wanted to be independent of both the Maoists and the police. The Maoists came and tried to kill her father and the police uh, stuck her in prison and are now raping her in prison. Uh, and in fact, the police who's organizing it was given a national law. So uh, for the two, uh, as uh, one of the uh, uh, activities uh, for International Women's Day, there's some people in India are organizing, a, they organized a one million rising support of this woman to bring up the issue of her situation 
and to change various laws and, and practices so that uh, not many more people will face the same uh, experience. And then I found, I mean, uh, somebody sent me something and said, hey, sign this and put it on Facebook. Put it on Facebook. And then I asked, well, is there anything happening? And they said, you know, start something off uh, in your area. So I sent out a message saying, what is it? I'm in Canada, is anything happening here? And through that, I actually found out that some people in Ottawa were doing something and was able to go and connect with them and, uh, and, and do something. So uh, I'm often sort of uneasy about the privacy uh, conditions on your Facebook. But sometimes uh, getting involved with the community. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on to a Q&A session. I will be led by Lucy Um, we have a Reddit feed going on right now with other people asking questions, but I still want to throw it out to you guys if you have any questions, just go right ahead. Yeah? Uh, um, well, thank you. Uh, thank you for my question. Religious tribunal. 
I would say, you, know, you, you have to describe your framework. Okay, I would say that in Afghanistan, and I have lived in that region, I have lived at the border of Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, in that triangle. Over there, if somebody, when I was living there, if somebody asked me, would you rather have nothing or have the religious freedoms? I would say I would have the religious freedoms. Because in that, you know, rock bottom, it would at least elevate you to level one. Okay, but from level one, again, you can get to the top of Empire State Building. Okay, so let's say, you know, again, in another framework, let's say in Canada, would having those religious tribunals actually be helpful to us and take us to a higher level, or would it actually take us to a lower level? Again, these are questions we need to ask. Now, you know, again, you know, it's about understanding what Sharia law is, what Sharia law, again, as we talked about, is different in various, you know, how they practice Sharia law in Saudi Arabia, and how they practice it in Iran, and how they practice it in Somalia, or it is practiced in these tribunals in Pakistan or in India, they are different. They are very different. They, are, they, are, they have a lot in common, but at the same time, they are different. Now, the Quran itself, and I have read the Quran very closely. I even have it on my Kindle. So when I have to quote it, I will pull out my Kindle and just quote it. For example, I'm going to give you one example. In the Quran, um, there is one verse about the hijab. It's not even about the hijab. Basically, there's one verse in the Quran that says a woman has to cover her beauty. A beauty, a beauty, You're her beauty. So, you know, different ulama, which means the, the scholars, the religious scholars, they have interpreted the word beauty in various different ways. Okay, some of them have said it means so like she has to cover her face, the other she has to cover all of her body, no, she doesn't have to, you know, so there are like, 40 different, 40 and 400 different. So I mean, to interpret the Quran and to interpret religious law and hadith and all of that, and then to turn it into law, you are going to end up with a zillion different versions. But again, you have to be clear about the framework. Are we talking about Afghanistan? Is that going to be helpful in Afghanistan under Taliban rule? That should have the street, you know, absolutely. I totally agree. Yes, it is helpful. But in Canada, in the West, so we need to sit down and talk in detail about that and about the consequences. I do agree that we have to talk about it and see what works, but I, it's not, what I'm saying isn't it's a lesser of two evils. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying that it depends on who interprets it and how it's interpreted. I'm not. You know, okay, but how it means the law. Have you read the Iranian Constitution? What is the law? Okay, the Iranian law is very clear that actually there is a video. It's called How to Beat Your Wife. Have you seen that? Okay, it, it is by, by a scholar. It is by a religious scholar. I really recommend that you watch that. Basically, they discuss, and according to Iranian law, please read it. It is available online in English. Please do read it. It says that a, a husband is allowed to punish his wife. Now, how to punish that wife, you know, punish, the word punishment is open to discussion. So please go, it is on YouTube, and, um, you know, there is a religious scholar who's talking about how, not that you are allowed or not allowed to beat your wife, or how you should beat your wife. So, you know, by all means, sorry. What, I'm sorry, I just need to, because, yeah, I don't want you to walk away not feeling, I'm feeling more missing. Yeah, there's a place. Yeah, there's a place. Oh, yeah, you guys are not. So, would, would, would it be something that you're saying we should consider or look at, or what harm could it bring? Or all I'm saying like, is, I mean, all I'm saying is that um, I don't have, I mean, Islamic law, just like Judaic law, or other types of laws are, you know, they need significant study and knowledge. It's just that this recent article came to mind by someone on the board of directors of Amnesty International USA, who's Pakistani, who's Muslim, and her doctorate is on how uh, there are elements in Islamic law that actually preserve women's rights. And she listed some examples in, in US cases where she was entitled to the money or the agreements stipulated in the Islamic marriage contract. So I just think it's more like I'm raising um, other facets. Like sometimes you can have judges here in Canadian law that then you know, uh, have a, have a, uh, uh, how can I say, a verdict that's outrageous. So all I'm saying is, 
I don't know. It's it's just yeah, like this love is love deserves its own understanding. It doesn't mean that it's you you say let's not completely close the door on, on any of like let's not open it but let's let's be open minded to know more about it. Let's not just bash it, let's not just say it's it's, it's bad. I've read the article that you're talking about and it was really, really interesting. And that woman she's way she, she, she's so educated, and the way that she, just with that, what she said in that article alone educates a lot of people. I am for looking at positive things. My mother was in Mogadishu when, when all hell was breaking loose, okay? I don't know how many people fought the war in Somalia, but for over 20 years, we had no government. Everyone was just carrying around AK-47s. Women were getting raped left and right. Children were getting murdered. Hundreds of thousands of people were starving to death. The Al-Shabaab came, which is a part of the Al-Qaeda. And when they came and they took over the city, my mother was happy. And my mother is a very liberal feminist woman. She's been married six times. She used to run her own businesses in three different continents. I was shocked. I said, Mom, are you crazy? You're happy because they are there. These are, you know, these are Taliban. These are the Al-Qaeda. And my mother said, this is the most peace we have seen. Because they brought on Sharia law. And we had cases of people getting their hands cut off, we had stonings happening, and here I am in North America freaking out, I want to go take over the world because they have brought such medieval, barbaric practice to my hometown, but yet to my mother and to the residents there, that's what gave them peace for the first time in years. So there are parts of Sharia law that are beneficial, that are not horrific, but by Western standards, they look down upon it. What I, my argument is that we should not bring anything that has to do with Sharia law, any other religious law. Or any religious law. Into, into our constitutional rights in our court system. We should actually be protected against it. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I, mean, right. no, I, mean, I, I agree that there are different kinds of Sharia law, just as there are different kinds of different specific embodiments of Sharia law, just as there are specific embodiments of secular law, of post enlightenment principles. In some cases, today in the world, uh, women have more rights under Islamic law than they do under secular law. So for instance, after divorce, typically after the divorce, the woman winds up worse off than the man. And this is uh, closely connected to how matrimonial property is treated. That is, whether the property that a couple will accumulate in the course of their marriage, get, how it gets divided. Now, in Indonesia, the courts predominantly interpret Islamic law to give uh, that uh, for, for both partners to a marriage equal rights to a matrimonial property. Uh, a right which uh, uh, women don't have, divorce, women getting divorced don't have more than half the, you know, uh, half the state slash provinces in North America. So there are particular laws framed as Islamic laws that give, give women more rights than particular uh, laws framed as post enlightenment secular laws. So it all depends on the uh, What's better depends on what uh, on the specific ways in which the call of Islam and the, and the vision of the uh, enlightenment get interpreted in institution wise. You know, I, I, there is a there is a little problem here, and that is that you know nobody is saying that any law on the face of the planet is a hundred percent evil. I think it would be very difficult to find you know a set of laws that we can qualify as one hundred percent evil. No, this was written by Satan himself. No, you know, different when you put different sets of laws against each other and you compare them. Well, of course, Sharia law would have some good things in it, and secular law would have good things in it. The thing is that you have to put them next to each other. You have to look at the framework and what your framework is, and then you have to decide which one is better. You know, so so this is what it is at the end of the day. And again, which one is better or what works and what doesn't depends on the circumstances. So you know, again, the circumstances are we talking about India, are we talking about Pakistan, are we talking about Afghanistan, are we talking about Somalia? And each one of these settings are extremely unique, uh, they are very sensitive, they are very complicated, so we need to understand that, you know, and there are so many variables that come in, you know, not only even women, let's say religious minorities. How are religious minorities, for example, mean? How are children being treated? So these are all the elements, and they're extremely huge and complicated. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> um, if, if I could just suggest, we only have about like, like not that much time left. So um, if you do have questions, feel free to ask panelists during the wine and cheese afterwards. And we're just going to take one more question. Oh, really? Wow. <laughs> um, okay, I'm just going to make a very small, less than one minute comment, and then I can have a question. Um, with regards to religious law versus secular law, just in terms of the West, and I'm familiar with the American context more than the Canadian, but the process of law and of judges being appointed is something that you can appeal, and judges are appointed in a political process. And they have to be at the appeals level, they have to be approved by politicians and they're appointed by politicians, and if you don't like how the judges are appointed, then you can hold people out. And if you don't like the decision that the Supreme Court made, then you can organize against it. Um, so there's, but then in, when you go to religious tribunals, there isn't any kind of appeal. There isn't, it's not a process, any kind of political, aka democratic process. So I think that's part of the difficulty to do when you compare to the Okay, this is my question. Um, for uh, the I'm wondering if, in the course of um, the activism work that you've done and the, and the advocacy, do you have any regrets in, in terms of the work you've done or things that have happened or choices that you've made? And from the beginning of sort of engaging in activism to today, have you changed how you've done things and what has happened? For me, activism started at a very young age. I sort of knew uh, what, I, what I saw as injustice or wrong from a very young age. Age five, my uncle would leave his wife. The rest of the family would go in their rooms. I would be jumping on his back. It was just part of some, you know, something that I was. At a very young age, I had an arranged marriage with a cousin. I had to get out of that. I was put in jail in the Middle East. I had to get out of that. Um, I came to North America. I had my daughters, and I decided um, to continue what I was what I was doing, but even you know, more, um, even even harder, like fight harder, not just for myself, but make sure I did political action, make sure I took part in local community federal program, anything that I could take part in to put my voice, whether it directly affected me or whether it affected the young woman that I was still in high school or whether I decided to continue with that. And I have I have no regrets whatsoever. I've made my daughters into little feminists, and hopefully they. <laughs> Uh, actually, yeah. Well, feminism sort of didn't work out for me. Yeah. I found that the root awakening that feminism was filled with racism in North America. Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, you know this right now. A little bit of feminist stuff. Uh, that was uh, maybe my belief in feminism. I was a little misguided. But, um, you know, I have, I have absolutely no regrets. And I continue to train, I continue to empower young women uh, from my culture, from them mainstream culture from I'm always empowering young women to be who they can be. So. Yeah, you know, yeah, I, I think it is amazing how, you know, people like us who, you know, have very, very similar past in so many ways, you know, we all agree with that. You know, I mean, you know, the act activism, you know, what I did wasn't, you know, what I started with wasn't even activism. I was uh, a teenager when the revolution in Iran happened. I was 13 years old, and I had grown up dancing to the Bee Gees. I was in love with Donny Osmond, okay? I, is that I regret? <laughs> well, no, actually, that is the PowerPoint of the whole thing. I still like it. Anyhow, uh, you know, so, and my dad was a ballroom dancing instructor. I wore bikinis on the beach. I had a green one with white polka dots. And I would be dancing on the beach with boys and girls, and you know, just teenagers, just was having fun. Yeah, it was yeah. a shop time. So, you know, we were just having fun. I was probably the furthest point in the universe from whatever you would call political. Like the furthest point, you know, that, that far. And then the revolution happened. And what made me react to the revolution was that Having fun became illegal. What I did, the way I reacted to the revolution was not even political. I just went, I was a 14 year old who wanted to have fun. And having fun, illegal. I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to turn into an activist, the bikini activist. You know, the girl who wants to wear a bikini and just look pretty. And that was the extent of it. But the way Iran suddenly turned, now it is a very complicated process, and I give like three hour lectures on it. But 
But the way Iran turned a myth having an illegal and turned into an outspoken activist. I basically during calculus class, I raised my hand and I asked the calculus teacher, which you know was 18 years old, the new calculus teacher. He didn't know any calculus. I think uh, my my calculus knowledge was greater than hers. And you know, I raised my hand. She was teaching propaganda instead of calculus. And I raised my hand and I said, I said to her, Can you please teach calculus? And she said, You know, like what I what I what I'm teaching, leave. And I I left the class. And that led to a school-wide student strike, and I became the leader of a strike. At the age of 14, you know, imagine that. So it was outrageous, and then I was arrested and put in prison and tortured and raped, and you know, I'm not gonna get into the whole extent of it, but um, now when I look back, I'm, you know, now at the age of 48, and I have been on the road now for seven years, I give an average of seven, six, seven talks a week at travel, I see, you know, it has become my full-time job. And now people, you know, when, when, when I look back on my life, there is one thing, one thing I can honestly be proud of. Only one. And that is that day at calculus class. That I believed something was wrong. And regardless, like I mean only 14 year old can do that. Regardless of consequence, completely oblivious to it, I raised my hand and said, wait a second. This is calculus class. This is not propaganda class. Start teaching calculus. And I would, you know, I, and I, I, I have spent the rest of my life paying for that moment. And if I have to choose one thing I'm proud of, it is that single act at the age of 15. Because you know what? It was the right thing. Yes. On behalf of Journalists for Human Rights and Amnesty International McHale, thank you all for joining us. And a special thanks to our panelists. Uh, we really, really appreciate you coming out. I know you all have very busy schedules. Uh, we appreciate your insight. I certainly learned a lot tonight, and I'm sure I can say the same for everyone here, so thank you. <laughs> this is also the finale of our End Violence Against Women Week. Uh, I'd like to thank all the members of the Amnesty International and JHR that made this week possible. I encourage you to join our Facebook, Facebook social media, our yes. Facebook groups uh, to see the work we do. Um, we also have tables set up on both sides of the room to know more. Also, there are petitions um, on, in each row. You probably are sitting on them, actually. So we encourage you to sign them um, and them in on the Amnesty table on the left before you leave. And we are serving more questions in the back. So help yourself and thank you all. Have a good evening.